just as a reminder to our participants, if you need to sneak off and take care of something personal, uh, just make sure you mute your mic and turn off your camera. We don't want any accidents on the screen. And we'll get ready and jump into the Department of Health and Biomedical Sciences at UTRGV. Uh, with us today, we have Dr. Suan Chu, who is a faculty member in the Biomedical Sciences program. We have Ms. Daniela Gill and Ms. Crystal Villarreal from the Clinical Laboratory Science program. And they're gonna be able to give us an overview of the department and answer any questions you have about our programs in health and biomedical sciences. Dr. Chu, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Lettingham. I'm gonna share my screen. I just have a few slides for you guys. Um, we may need to make you a host. Yes, I think they made me a host if I'm not mistaken because then, I've been getting like asking me to let people in. So that's your host. <laughs> so I, I think I've gotten the access. Can you guys see my screen here? Yes? Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. As Dr. Lettingham said, I am Swen Chu and I'm one of the faculty in the BS in Biomedical Sciences program which um, from now on, I will be referring it to it as BMET program. So the BMET program, I would, I would like to start off by telling you guys um, what kind of students may be interested in this program. So it's a good preparatory course for healthcare professionals. So a lot of times our students or um, high school students or parents do not know that if they want to become a physician, a dentist, a veterinarian, a pharmacist, a PT or OT, they need to um, oftentimes, and for most of these programs, they will need to get a bachelor's degree first. So the BMET degree is very good for those who are thinking to get into this career track, into the the clinical health professional site and um, it's it's appropriate for it um, because it's a, a course where they learn biology but they learn human biology so the examples they get will be related to diseases pathology that humans um, are, 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 are going to face um, another thing that um, students can uh, might be interested in is preparatory courses or preparatory degree for graduate studies so if they want to become a biomedical or translation scientist a epidemiologist a nutritionist um, uh, or work as a, a a researcher in academia or in the government or industry, um, they might want to get a master's degree or a PhD later on. Um, the BMAT BS in biomedical science is a good degree to get first to prepare them for the MS or PhD degrees. Um, the BMAT program is also suitable for students who, who want to Get, get a bachelor's degree and straight out get into becoming a teacher maybe in high school um, or um, becoming a medical lab technician or we also have a lot of students who become research assistants in the laboratories um, in the medical school or um, stay on in our department as, um, as a research assistant or technicians. So um, just an overview, I wanted to start with the career so that you get a hang of what, what kind of students to think about when you, um, when you talk to them about the BMAT program. Um, so this program, you know, the students will learn um, a combination of basic sciences like the, the cell and molecular biology, microbiology, immunology, and then they will also learn the clinical side um, or the, the more uh, physiology and anatomy side. So we have anatomy, physiology, neuroscience, that's all connected to human health like I said before. Um, so a lot of our classes will be will be delivered through a flipped classroom method. So, you know, our students will, will start off with web-based um, um, delivery of videos or um, reading content. And then when they come to class, we would work with them with interactive face-to-face, -face, team-based learning, case-based or project-based um, examples, um, studies, um, so that they, they get to apply what they learn. Um, uh, a lot of our students are also op offered or also exposed to clinical time and laboratory time. So just an overview of the courses, it's 49 hours of BMAT coursework um, with 23 hours of the support courses um, that are required. And then they have to meet all the UTRGV and state requirements um, for core courses. And then um, this program is designed for four years. So our students come in freshman year, they start off in the BMAT program. 
Um, so the application requirement, they, they have to submit the UTRGV application, but they also need to make sure that they also apply to the BMAT online application form. Um, with that, they, they would be submitting um, their transcript. Um, they are any, if they take any college credits before, they need to make sure they also submit those, um, the SAT or ACT scores. And they also need, on top of the BMAT online application form, they need also to make sure they fill out the BMAT student information survey. Um, so, you know, what kind of students we are, are we looking for? Um, we definitely are looking for students that are, are, are going to study hard and do well. Um, so, you know, they, they will develop this skill starting from their high school and, and mostly in classes uh, in their science and math courses. They need to make sure they, they are strong in those. Um, and if they're taking college credit, um, I know a lot of students, you know, they take dual, um, dual enrollment. They need to make sure they do well in them. So make sure A and B in those college credit courses. Um, they, they need to, because our, our courses are delivered through a flipped classroom method, we need to make sure that they are, are able to study um, independently. They need to be able to do the web-based contents by themselves, be motivated, and it's a lot of learning time management skills. And it's, it's, it's a struggle in the beginning, but you know, if, if they, they learn this from high school, it, it will be a more smooth transition for them. Um, critical thinking skills is, is definitely something we, we need and we learn look at because of the in-class assignments. Those, the flip-based um, in-class assignments, they're very application-based, so it's not only just memorizing the facts, they need to be able to know how to apply it to the cases that we are we are going to discuss in class. Um, and you know, Dr. Lettingham uh, discussed this before, a lot of our, our majors um, in our department, as well as the BMAT program, we need strong teamwork skills um, because that's in the reality. Health professionals, they work in the team. Um, researchers work in the teams too. So they need to, to be able to work well in a team and also develop strong writing and oral presentation skills um, because we do a lot of that in the classes and in their career in the future. So just other information I wanted to share with you. Um, the BMAT pro program has a community of care and support. We have a program manager um, that helps with making sure that the students are on track. Um, if they need any help, they can reach out to her, um, Ms. Rosalinda Garza. I'm going to give you her information at the end. We also have an instructional facilitator um, and and this facilitator we call her the IF or he or she or IF and she um, they will they um, this individual will also make sure that the the mentors and trainee under them that um, helps with the coach study hour which are supplemental instructions for our freshman and sophomore classes um, are, are, are providing the support that our students need um, and other things that we have our, in our program we have the BMAT ambassador program which are uh, which is a good program for those uh, students who are interested in helping us promote and, and tell the community about our program. Um, they help us with our um, open houses and any, any events that we have, graduation, our white coat ceremony, our ambassadors are always there to help us. We also have the scholars program. So this program is good for those um, who are strong academically as well as strong in other skills that we are looking at. And it's students who want to get a little more from the BMAT program. So there are more students who will be um, given more first-hand opportunities with the shadowing and clinical experiences. Um, they also are going to be provided workshops and training to develop their le leadership skills more. Um, and, you know, we tell our students, make sure to look into the early acceptance assurance programs in UTRGV and the UTRGV Honors College um, as opportunities as well. Um, in the BMAT program, we, we see that research is such an important important um, component for every single student, not only those who are thinking of becoming research scientists. We, 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 we believe that, you know, doing research is good for our health professionals to, to be able to, to learn to, you know, think about evidence and how they are going to use evidence to, to support um, the cases or support their, their diagnosis or what they are planning to do with their, their patients. So, you know, because of this, every single BMAT student has to take four research courses Courses and it's mandatory for all our students and they take it their sophomore and junior year. So second and third year, they start taking these independent research courses. Um, and we have something called the Biomedical Freshman Research Initiative. Um, 
the acronym for it is BFRI. So for students that, you know, they're excited to learn about research at the, the start of their BMAT um, time in uh, the university, we offer them this program and it's a first come first serve program where about a third of our students um, get into the program and the, the students start in these same research courses, but their freshman and sophomore year. So they kick it off earlier and they get exposed to a little bit more research. And we tell our students and we encourage them to join research laboratory because the one-on-one -on -one attention that they get from mentors, um, they, they do gain much more. Um, I, I want to, you know, I because I'm, I'm talking to counselors from high school, I also want to promote um, the other programs that our students can get into our laboratory starting from their high school, uh, time in high school. So there are two summer research opportunities for high school students. Um, the first one is the RGV Summer Science Internship Program. It's about six weeks long. It's a partnership with the UT School of Public Health. And in the end, the students get to do an oral PowerPoint presentation. And that, that's amazing for uh, high school students to start off with a PowerPoint presentation. It's usually posters for our undergrads. So this, this is a big, and uh, I'm very impressed about the caliber of the students that come through this program. Um, another thing that you know, um, UTRGV has is the High Scholars Program. Um, and this program is with the Math and Science Academy. And it's about a 10-week program, and the students do a written proposal, a final research paper, and then a poster presentation. And this is, this is also a very, very good program that I, I encourage you to tell your students about. And it's a good way for them to see, you know, how they like BMAT, meet some BMAT faculty, and get exposed to research starting from high school, and see if BMAT is the, the right, right uh, path for them. So I'm going to leave you guys with this contact information. Um, the Department of Health and Biomedical Sciences is where we are part of. Um, we are are part of the BS in Biomedical Sciences. We have a Brownsville and Edinburgh location. And um, Miss, Miss Rosalinda Garza is your BMAC program coordinator or manager that you can contact to get more information. Um, thank you for your time. And I will give you back to, I guess, Dr. Leddingham or maybe um, Crystal or Daniela will be taking over. We'll go ahead and jump to Crystal and Daniela. I think they're gonna tag team this and they've both been given host access. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Good morning. I will be starting the presentation and uh, Krista will be, help me finish it. Okay. Can you guys see the screen? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is the Clinical Laboratory Science Program. We are under the College of Health Professions, under the Department of Health and Biomedical Sciences. And uh, this, is our this is our class for 2020. We have uh, 20 students currently enrolled in the program. This is uh, the Clinical Laboratory Science Program faculty. Our program director is Ms. Tijerina. She's in charge of the program. We have several clinical assistant professors, Ms. Aguirre, Ms. Villarreal, which she's online right now, Ms. Briones and myself. We also have assistant professor, Dr. Andetta, and associate professor, Dr. Gilderson. The objective is to go over the profession, the program overview and the entrance requirements and the roadmap for completion for this program. So a little bit about the profession, and I, I want to start off by saying that I'm sure a lot of us have gotten our blood drawn in the past before. And if you ever have wondered who are the people that take care of giving the, pay, uh, the doctor the laboratory results, they are the medical laboratory scientists or medical technologists. We are highly skilled scientists who discover the presence or absence of disease and provide data that help physicians determine the diagnosis and treatment for the patient. Although we are not often personally involved with the patients, we play a crucial role in the process of providing personalized care. We generate vitally important data for identifying and treating cancer, heart disease, liver disease, diabetes, infections, immunological diseases, and many, many other health conditions. The job outlook for the clinical laboratory science. Uh, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, in 2019, the median pay is about $53,000 a year or about $25 uh, an hour. Uh, the profession has an increased job outlook from 11% from 2018 to 2028. And this can be attributed to the increase in demand in laboratory services and technology advancements, such as molecular and genetic testing that require educated skilled professionals. 
And I want to point out also that the medical laboratory scientists are the first line essential responders testing for the novel coronavirus, also known as COVID-19. Some opportunities here for the clinical laboratory science uh, degree. Um, we can find employment in a wide range of areas, including hospital clinical laboratories, commercial or reference laboratories, public health, pharmaceutical or chemical industries, biotechnology companies, uh, forensic and law enforcement, veterinary clinics, research and teaching institutions, transplant and blood donor centers, fertility clinics, cosmetics or food industry, and this is a great foundation for graduate education in healthcare, which includes, but it's not limited to, uh, our new degree in doctorate in clinical laboratory science, medical school particularly, uh, physician assistant school, and other healthcare uh, professions. A little bit about the program overview at uh, UTRGV. This clinical program degree will separate students for will prepare students for certification and employment as medical laboratory scientists. Our graduates are part of the healthcare team and play a vital role in the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of disease through the performance of laboratory tests in the laboratories. It also serves, as I mentioned, as an excellent undergraduate option for those students planning on applying to the graduate physician assistant program, medical or dental school. And I will let my friend Crystal take over. All right, good up. Uh, I guess good morning, everyone. So some of the pro uh, program or overview for academic requirements, we do have, it is a program, so you do have to apply for the program. Um, this program is offered, it begins in the fall semester, and so the application is usually due in the spring prior to beginning. And so we do require a minimum of a 2.0 GPA, and we do have to meet the core, uh, core prior to applying to the program. Uh, besides the core, we do require additional science courses and they're all listed here and they're all pretty much biology, chemistry, microbiology and statistics. And this is gonna provide you with a good foundation into the courses that you'll be taking once you um, begin the program if you get accepted. So on to the next one. So once you do get accepted into the program, the program application is due in, uh, in March, and usually the students will find out if they got accepted by the end of May, early June. So once the program, you've been accepted into the program, as I mentioned, it will start in the fall. And so it is a 15 month program. So you start in one fall and you graduate the following fall uh, of the following year. So how it is composed and broken down is from August to May of the, your junior year, It'll be nine months on campus. And so there you will learn the theory and techniques um, to, to be able to apply those theories and techniques into the actual practicum. So we learn the core courses that we learn in the program are hematology, which are the study of the cells, uh, clinical chemistry. I'm sure most of you have gotten or heard of people with um, checking your glucose. Oh, my cholesterol's too high. That's in chemistry. We check all that there blood bank and serology. If you've ever donated blood, you probably already know your blood type. So in blood bank, we actually, we know how to do blood typing as long as well as cross matches to make sure that patients that are receiving blood are going to, you know, be compatible. In microbiology, as Ms. Gill mentioned, in micro, we do all types of testing with microorganisms. Right now, the biggest one, we have COVID. Your analysis, we've all um, been given that yellow little cup, pee in the cup. So in UA, we figure out if you have a UTI. So the theory is learned the first nine months, so all of a fall semester and all of the spring semester on campus. During the second portion of the program, the last six months, which is from June all the way to December, that's where you're actually going to apply all the theory in the hospital. And so students uh, will then be assigned to different hospitals all the way from Mission all the way to Brownsville. So we have about seven to eight uh, uh, clinical affiliates that our students go to, and that's where they actually practice everything that they learn, and they get the clinical practicum experience, and this gets them prepared to be work, you know, to start working after. So what if, let's say, okay, Ms. Villarreal, Ms. Gill, I'm, this sounds very interesting to me. What can I do to make sure that I get accepted into the program the first time around. So even though we require 2.0 or above for a GPA, we really are looking for students that have a higher GPA, especially in the science courses. So if you remember the 
prerequisites, all those science courses, your biologies, your anatomies, your chemistries, if you can maintain a 3.0 or higher, this is going to be really good for you when we start looking at your application. If you're able to show that you have, that you complete uh, 14 hours or more per semester, that's a good indication because when you start our program, you're taking 18 hours a semester. So if you show us that in one semester you took 14 or more hours and you've got really good grades, it's a good indication that you'll be a great student for us because you'll be successful in our program because you've, you've been used to taking a big course load. A student with high level of critical thinking and complex problem solving is very essential uh, for our program. Student with dedication, determination, um, again, because it is a very rigorous program, it's 18 hours per semester. So, and somebody who's able to multitask and maintain composure under pressure. Not only will it help you in the program, but it'll also help you once you're in the laboratories and hospitals or any of the other locations, um, you know, other places that you may be able to work. It's very important to, to maintain composure under pressure. All right, so some of the common issues or concerns that students may have in regards to our profession, because we do deal with a lot of, you know, infectious disease or pathogens. So some of the concerns are, um, if, what can we do to minimize this? So most definitely you will have to have all your vaccines prior to starting the program. And so they're listed there. And prior to starting the program and also the clinical rotations in order to go to the hospitals, you will be required to have all of your vaccines. But not only do you have to have your vaccines, but in the laboratory and uh, once you start in our program, we, we teach students about laboratory safety. And this will also help decrease you know, the probability of exposure. And we follow our program and hospital laboratories adhere to strict safety procedures and must comply with OSHA regulations. So we teach our students how to properly handle samples and how to compose themselves so that they prevent um, any accidents. So these are some resources that you can get information in regards to our profession. We have ASCLS, ASCP, and TACLS. I'll give you a second if you want to write them down. All right, and so the next one we have frequently asked questions, and of course we are going to have we're in a live Q and A, so we can answer more questions. But some of the questions is, do I need to take a test to work in this profession after graduation? The answer is yes. So graduates must sit um, and pass the uh, American Society for Clinical Pathology or ASCP board exam to become a certified um, uh, MLS, medical laboratory scientist. And this one needs to be re renewed every three years. And you usually accomplish that by continuing education courses. Are there jobs available for medical laboratory scientists? And this is a big, big yes, okay? In fact, there are nationwide short shortage of medical laboratory scientists. Most of our students from um, our program find a job right after graduation. So, I mean, so honestly, to be honest with you, some of our students will be even offered a part-time job on the weekends after they've done their clinical rotations because that's how, how much our you know, profession is in need. And I know Ms. Gill mentioned that this could be a stepping stone to, it's a great stepping stone for medical school, PA school, or any other healthcare professional. If let's say, for example, plan A, medical school, does not happen the first year, you, if you go through the medical or uh, clinical laboratory science program, you could still be working, studying for your MCAT again, and then reapply for med school the following year. So this is a great, um, you know, you will be working, you'll be making a decent amount of money. So this is definitely a, you know, we are honestly seeking more, more students to go into our profession because we're in such dire need. Okay, so the next one, okay, what is the approximate annual salary for graduates in this area? So it, it you know, it, it's, between forty-six to sixty thousand dollars a year here in this area, but that is, you know, that doesn't count if you work evening shifts or night shifts. Sometimes they give you, well, they usually give um, shift differential in, in their evenings and nights. So of course, if you go to a different state, if the uh, cost of living is higher, you may be making more money uh, there as well. So it just depends on the area. But here in the valley, it's about forty-six to sixty thousand dollars a year. All right, so if you are looking for information um, to our clinical laboratory science program here at UTRGV, Ms. Sylvia Garcia is our admin and she is wonderful about getting back to you in regards to any uh, questions, uh, comments, concerns in regards to our program. So you can get her email address and also her phone 
so that way she can you, you know answer any questions that you may have. All right, well, I think that's it for us. And I guess now we can go to Dr. Lettingham who will start our Q&A. Excellent, and I'll moderate this a little bit here as we get into it. Mm -hmm. uh, we've already got a couple of questions here in the chat, and let's kind of clear those out first. Uh, the first one here came from Dr. Alvarado, and this is for BMED, for Dr. Chu. Is okay. this the best degree for those students wanting to get into med school? I would say yes. I would say, you know, it's a, it's a program where they learn human biology. So it really prepares them. And, and the BMED program, the way we teach it is very much how the, the medical school has the flipped classroom um, approach. So a lot of the students that, you know, end up in medical school, they come back and tell us that, you know, the way we taught them in BMED and the curriculum that was set up for them, it was a good um, a good pathway, a good um, preparation for them to apply to medical school. So I would say my answer would be yes. Great. And uh, there's two follow-ups. I think both of these questions apply to health and biomedical sciences, specifically to the BMED program. Okay. With the summer programs, what are some of the special requirements needed to enter? Um, so I, I told you guys about two programs. The first one was the RGV Summer Science Program, and that's with the UT School of Public Health. Um, I would say that one has a, a smaller cohort, so it's more competitive to get in, and it's, it's a program that they do look into first-generation students. So, you know, I would say if you have first-generation students, um, it's a good one that you try to uh, encourage them to apply. Um, and if they're not, apply as well. You know, I've gotten some that are not first-generation, that I've seen um, go through the program as well. For the high scholars program, I would say they take in more students, um, but you know, it's still a still pick the students. So both, you know, it's a competitive program and the students need to show and they need to write a good essay to show why they're interested in science and why they're interested in learning more about research. So I hope that clears it up. If not, um, follow up with a question and I can help explain more. And for both programs, they are available for uh, students in the McAllen area as well as the Brownsville area. That's great. And with the Summer Science Internship Program, they've got an excellent success rate. Students who True. have started out in that program, they get into college, they graduate college, they go on to a professional degree and they do very well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they're looking at a 98% college graduation rate and upper 70s of getting into more advanced programming. So it yeah. really does lay a great foundation in that program. I've had those interns in the past. Dr. Chu has. Mm -hmm. These are awesome students to work and, with. And I know Dr. Leddingham, you go to the to watch their their power their oral presentation, and it's it's students are high school students, but they're presenting like they're undergrads or graduate students. You know, very impressive. That's great. Um, Another follow-up for BMED, could the BS in biomedical sciences be used as a stepping stone to orthodontics? Yes, I would say a lot of the students also look into going to dental school and then specialize in orthodontics. Um, so it, it will be a good program as well. And then for those interested in that route to also look into early acceptance program um, or assurance program in the dental side, you know, that ties BMED and then going into a dental school. That's great. Now, uh, in terms of the housekeeping thing, these short presentations are encompassing a lot of what we've posted online. So we will try to get copies of the presentations gathered and posted after the conference. But I do want to make kind of a disclaimer. UTRGV and all colleges, they're constantly changing criteria and updating. That's one reason why we are so excited to do this now for a second year because program and mission standards change, courses change. So everything that you hear from us, we're gonna put kind of a one year time limit on the program specific elements, the larger how to get in things and things like that. We don't change them very often, but we are constantly having to improve and work with our programs. Now in terms of opportunities for Star County and other areas, uh, we would have to ask the program directors for those summer science programs. 
I know we've had students come in from other areas, but often we know students are sometimes limited due to travel restrictions. So we do try to keep them close to home because it, both of these summer programs require them to go to a site and spend some time doing the research projects there. Question here, this is for uh, Daniela and Crystal. Do you consider students into the clinical lab science program who are actively members of HOSA during their high school years? So when we actually look at the application, we really um, don't look at the high school. However, if you are in HOSA, it's really going to help you, be, you know, get really good grades on your prerequisite requirements. So when we look at the application, we look at the courses that are required in your science GPA uh, from UTRGV. But, I mean, continue to be in HOSA. HOSA is wonderful. It's going to be a really good foundation to biologies, your chemistries, your anatomies, and it's really going to help you uh, quite a bit. It's just that when we look at the application, it's all from UTRGV, what you have done at the university. I would just add a little bit to that in terms of dual enrollment. If students did dual enrollment, like they took their histories or political sciences or something, dual enrollment, those credits are going to count and transfer in, mm -hmm. and those grades transfer, and that's going to impact their GPA. So with dual enrollment, I mean, we generally advise our students stay away from the math and sciences. That way it's fresh in your head and you're getting the right prerequisite coursework right before you enter any of our programs. But if they do comp one, comp two, history, some of the other areas for dual enrollment, they need to be getting A's in those classes because that grade's going to transfer and they're going to look at that grade when they make decisions. And if they get a C, it's passing, but that could hurt especially with our undergraduate programs that have admission requirements like nursing and CLS. Okay, a uh, question from Ms. Alvarez. Can we share your information with the students to Dr. Chu? Yes, of course. Um, I'm going to put the two links here, um, but please be aware, you know, because the program is already running, the application process is already closed, but, you know, start having them look into it like beginning of spring. I'm going to put the both links here. And just another comment about that, the high scholars program, they, it's interesting, but they do take students that already finish their high school and transitioning into college. So this semester, this summer, I have a student that's coming into the BMAP program. So she already finished high school, but she, you know, so a graduating senior can also be in there. And then the summer science program, they look a lot to like sophomore, junior students. Um, and I'll put more information there for you guys. All right, other questions? Now I know we've got two other programs, but oh, one just popped up, so I won't have to fill time to use, type it in. Uh, do you have any graduate degree opportunities in clinical laboratory science? Do you mean in UTRGV or at UTRGV? Of, okay, at, okay. So we do have a master's of health science in clinical laboratory science, which Ms. Gill can actually talk about because she's a graduate of it. Yes. Uh, you do have to be a graduate in the CLS program, and you do have to be certified through ASCLS in order to apply for the master's in CLS program. It's a one-year uh, accelerated program, or you can do a two years part-time. And that's one of the other uh, two degree areas in the Department of Health and Biomedical Sciences that we've got some short presentations on that were pre-recorded, but we didn't have anyone from those programs with us available today. So our Master of Science in Health Science program, students do have to have a bachelor's degree and apply to each charge of these graduate school. And the accelerated online program, we have five different concentration areas. We offer healthcare administration, nutrition, health science informatics, clinical laboratory sciences, and health prof professions education and technology in those programs. And Dr. Foreman is a good resource for that information. 
also, we offer the Bachelor of Science in Nutritional Sciences, which is an undergraduate program that does have a admissions process, but it's not formalized at this point. Right now, it's kind of open admissions, but students do have some serious prerequisite coursework they have to take in terms of chemistry in order to get into some advanced nutritional coursework. And we've got two tracks in the BS in Nutritional Sciences. We have the Exercise and Nutrition track, which includes a lot of coursework in exercise science, and we have a General Nutrition track. And we're looking to add a couple more, I believe, over the next few years. This program is only in its third year, and it is growing because we have a need for people with a stronger background in nutrition, and this will prepare them for our future program, which is a Master of Science in Dietetics, which will be online here in the next two years. What other questions do you all have? Dr. Lettingham, I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, so for my campus, we offer a, a health science focused academy. So the kids who choose to attend our campus you know, they have the intentions of moving into, you know, the health professions. And so you guys obviously have a lot of degree availability. And, you know, this whole purpose is about the pathway. Like what's the correct, like, proper pathway for the kids? And so it's going to depend on how they maneuver these pathways. So my question is, um, and this is open to Dr. Chu and to Ms. Bill and everyone as well, what kind of degree plan would you recommend and for what kind of student? So... I'm sure a lot of the teachers and the counselors have had this conversation with particularly seniors on what major to pick. You know, would you go the BMED route versus the health route? Or would you choose BMED versus DLS to get into these professional programs? So what kind of major would you recommend for what particular kind of student? I'm gonna start off on the answer, then I'll let Dr. Chu and Ms. Villarreal and Ms. Gill chime in. We have to look at what the student's end dream is. If you have a high school student who is set on becoming a neurosurgeon, that's just that's their passion, they've had that same dream since they were a kindergartner, then of course we're going to push them in high school. They need to take and excel in every science class they can, preferably AP. Of course we're going to tell them to shy away from the dual enrollment sciences just because we want to make sure they get the right one so they don't lose any time when they come into the BMED program or something like that. But we really want to see them excel in their sciences. If they're interested in going into clinical laboratory science, I think almost the same concepts will apply. If they're interested in nutrition, the same applies. They really need to have a strong background in science, but they also need to work on their reading and writing skills. So when they're taking comp one or they're taking high school English at whatever level, if they get advanced chances for that, we really want them to focus on that as well as opportunities to engage in critical thinking throughout the program. All of our programs from the ground up are reading intensive. A lot of our programs work with the flipped classroom concept. So they're going to have to be self starters and be able to learn proper time management and those things. So as they come into it, they really need to kind of know what their end goal is, and we can kind of advise them, focus on the sciences, focus on your writing, get into your reading, work on your study skills, because it really depends on their pathway. If they're going the health pathway, we want to see community engagement. Sciences doesn't have to be as strong, but when they got their half credit of health in high school, we're going to expand on that tenfold. So this is when they just messed around and took it in summer and some online course and took a couple quizzes. I know that doesn't always happen, but I've heard horror stories. But if they've taken some good health science prep courses, that's going to help them out in every field. Dr. Chu, Crystal, Danielle, do you want to chime in? Ms. Villarreal or Ms. Gill, you want to? I, I would like to step in here. Uh, many times the students have... Um, especially high school students, they think, uh, or they have this dream of becoming a neurosurgeon. And then here comes the science courses and they take, for example, microbiology and they fall in love with it, which is many of our students do that. They 
they, they love microbiology and they want to know what else can I do with this degree. And then they start looking and then clinical laboratory science pops up. And microbiology is one part of our core learning and they apply for a program and they end up falling in love with the CLS program and they want to continue their route. So for high school students, um, even though they want to go into the medical field, many times they think I want to be a doctor or a nurse, but then once they start taking the prerequisites, then they know that their strength is more towards micro instead of anatomy. So they want to go into more towards our route. So yes, we want them to be very, um, for them to excel in all science courses because that's the foundation for any of our degrees um, needed to apply for any of our programs. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just want to add for BMAT, you know, it's a, it's a good program for those who are thinking to, to go on to another, you know, graduate health profession. So like a dentistry or PA or uh, becoming a medical physician or a pharmacist. Um, and then there's also the other route, which is, you know, for them to, to get more um, training in the graduate research site where they, you know, become a forensic scientist or um, a researcher in industry, you know. So I would say it's, it's a good preparatory degree if you see your students is interested in, you know, going further to, to, to gain those other educations after their bachelors. It's a good preparation. All right, well, thank you for that question. Hopefully we answered it. I know some of our answers seem broad, but one of the joys, and we'll talk about student advising a little bit later. I'm gonna have a little bit more feedback and we'll have some more questions on this. But when we're advising the health professions, we've got to step back and kind of see what their end goal is and see if that really matches what their current ability and desire is. And if it doesn't, how can we build them towards that or refer them to something that's really gonna help them? Now, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, the first one is, do we take credit for students that graduated in high school with an associates in biology from STC? So um, I'll take that question, Dr. Um, Lettingham. So uh, I've been working a lot with STC and TSC with our chair on getting this on board. Um, we are trying to set up articula articulation agreements for both of them. Um, and STC, I would say we are, we are almost there. We are hopefully getting the signatures and ready to go very soon. So um, keep in touch with us on that. Um, I'm hoping to get, give you guys good news on that. Um, and we, we are working very closely with um, Dr. Cervantes and Dr. Chowdhury with STC um, Associate in Biology on, on, you know, setting up, you know, like a two, two plus two program uh, or having a stick in credits that come in from STC. Okay, fantastic. Um, someone asked if we had the presentations where the department will come in and present these options to recruit. Uh, we do have a very active recruiting program for our BS in Biomedical Sciences program. Uh, our program director, even our lab coordinator, loves to go out and recruit in our high schools. We will share that information with them a little bit later. Our CLS program, when time allows, these are some busy faculty with our intense program, but they too like to get out, but I'm not gonna speak for them. But we can make arrangements from time to time for special presentations. You can always contact our department office and we'll get in touch with the right folks to hook you up and see if we can arrange some type of presentation if there's some interest in that area. Crystal? Yes, I, I've, I've been to La Jolla before. They've uh, asked, uh, asked me to to go present. So I'd be happy, I mean, if we are, if any of us are available, if you let us know with enough time, we will make the time. If I can't go, Ms. Gill may be able to go. Um, we'd love to talk about our profession because it's so, when you go to the hospital, you hardly ever see us. I always say we're lab rats because we're inside the lab. So you hardly ever see us. And so our profession is kind of very little hidden. Although right now, because of COVID, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, our profession's, you know, out there a little bit more because we are doing a lot of the testing. And so, um, it's getting out there slowly but surely, but most definitely I, we would love to go out there and uh, have a presentation. I'm sure Ms. Uh, Dr. Chu will too. I mean, any of us are, we are super excited about our profession. We love talking about it. So just let us know and we will definitely show up. Yes, I agree with Ms. Villarreal. And, 
And also, if you guys want to come visit our our facilities, you know, as as Dr. Lettingham said, you know, Ms. Munoz is very excited to show you our laboratories, the teaching one, and then the research one. So, um, either way, if you like us to go on camp, uh, go to your campus, or if you want to visit our campus, um, we can try to work something out, and we are excited to talk about it. Fantastic. Uh, we've got another follow-up question in the chat related to uh, dual enrollment courses. And the advice that I offer is very broad in the sense of we kind of advise our students to stay away from the sciences, partly because if students take the wrong science course, it, may, it will count for DTRGV credit. It may count towards the general education core but it might not count towards the degree. For example, let's say we've got a high school student who's interested in becoming a doctor and they take anatomy and physiology at the high school level, dual enrollment. When they transfer to UTRGV, when they transfer those hours in, and they want to try to get into BMED, they're going to discover that there's a pretty strong likelihood that's not going to count towards their degree because it doesn't perfectly line up. I know we're making some changes in BMED, but that's just one example that could happen. So the recommendation, and this is kind of my broad scope, is just focus on everything but science and math because we want to make sure we get the right science and the right math in as they go forward. Plus, if our students are thinking beyond undergraduate, if they want to go to med school, they want to get into a master's in OT, a master's in PT program, we want to make sure that they've got the best chance and the best grades and credit so that information is correctly on their transcripts to ease their transition into the application process for those programs. And I think it's it's also, you know, we want to, when they take even the basic courses um, that may, you know, count to it, the dual enrollment courses will count to it. So we rather you take it in the department so that they are exposed to, you know, the flipped classroom methods in the freshman class before jumping into our advanced classes. So I, we, we rather you take it with us. Now, just to follow up on the second part of your question, Mr. Kantu, uh, would there be a situation where we would or could recommend uh, dual enrollment science courses like bio or a and uh, I think one point, the one program that may take that with little or no headache would probably be our rehabilitation services program. They, really are not picky on the science component at this point in time. However, we do have as our core requirement in that program and at our next session at one o'clock, Mr. Mercado and Dr. Blanco will talk about that program in a little bit more detail. But they can really, they do require those classes because that's what we require in every one of our undergraduate programs in the Division of Health Affairs. Oh, another big question coming up here, two of them actually, let's see here. What about uh, UT on-ramp science courses? Do those transfer? If they're getting college credit, yes. I'm not as familiar with that program off the top of my head, but the credits will transfer, the courses may or may not, depending on the program they're transferring into. If it's in the health sciences, we would look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. If they're going into other sciences, if they're in biology, chemistry, uh, those programs may take some of the lower division ones. It really depends and I would have to follow up on that one. Next question, if a student would like to apply to medical school, pharmacy school, et cetera, and they earn credit for a science course through passing biology or chemistry AP, would they need to retake that course at the university level for program admittance? In terms of graduate programs like medical school or pharmacy school, 
each one of those schools has guidelines for what they require, their prerequisites. And usually it's a certain number of hours in each field, a certain mm -hmm. number of general biology, things like that. So in that sense... My year? Okay. Arenita? Okay, someone got her before I did. So in that sense, um, if they got AP credit for it, that doesn't always translate into college credit. So that might not work for their application in med school or PT school or pharmacy school. They may have to take that because often those programs, they want to see that college credit that was earned with a grade for the course. I know in our school of medicine, and I believe Dr. Valdez is listening in, she can maybe answer this, but they really, they want to make sure that you've got courses that are within the right time frame, high GPA taken at a university level, and that's what they look at in terms of application for the most part. So it's not so much about retaking uh, the courses, but they have to get the hours in on their transcript. So when they say they require 16 hours of chemistry, that they've taken Chem 1, Chem 2, Organic, and the other chemistries that they need. I'm just blanked on all of them. Uh, if they need certain numbers, counts of biology, usually that's six to eight hours in general biology, plus anatomy and physiology, plus microbiology, plus different things. So it really depends on the program. But a good question. Other questions, we have eight minutes left and then we have a break for lunch. And everyone's smiling, They're like, yes, food. Too bad we can't uh, provide lunch, but go ahead. I have a question. Yes. In regard to what I asked about the summer programs, I did hear that it was until they're in their sophomore year uh, of high school. And also, uh, the opportunities are not in the Sark County. I know you mentioned that because of where they need to do clinicals and things or the research, we understand that. We do, though, have a dual enrollment uh, for the summer program. So we do have some students that come to campus and are able to stay a certain part of the time um, on campus. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that there's a, the, the summer program for, for migrants and they do house them at the university. So just thinking of all that, mm -hmm. would there be any way or any ideas out there where we can have our students do like an internship in the summer for those that are really interested and find out if that's their real calling because a lot of the times our students you know, they say, I want this, this, and this, and then they get into the university and they're not there. So we just want them to be more, uh, have a better direction. I know we have uh, different courses now for the high schoolers, for the ones that are coming in as freshmen. Uh, they have path pathways. We have different ones and they are more geared very specifically to different areas. But just in those, you know, Thoughts, wondering about that, because I'm Roma High School. We're in the Stark County area. You mentioned McAllen, Brownsville, I believe. And so just, you know, phantom with the idea that maybe our students can be benefiting or could be doing that if we could bring them in somehow onto campus so they can really know what they want. I mean, just an idea. I don't know if that could be in there or not. So that's we common, I guess. Well, and, uh, question to, and I don't know. thank you for the common question. With the programs that Dr. Chu mentioned, we don't uh, have a say in like the review process of those programs. Those are outside of UTRGV. But what we do is we often will partner with these groups and we serve as the internship site but they have to apply and they have their own rules in those programs. We would have to reach out to those program coordinators to get a response on that but they'll take people from different areas. I know sometimes these are grant funded and they're targeting certain geographic regions, but I know Dr. Reiniger at the School of Public Health wishes she could open this up and expand it to a lot more students. This is a highly successful program, but they're constrained by their budget. But that's be a question to pose to the program coordinators 
I mean, if we could do it, if we had the mechanism, yes. We know some students are willing to travel and do whatever it takes. Uh, I know with some of the dual enrollment programs at the school, so uh, there's bus service offered from the school. And with these programs, travel is up to the student often. Thank you. Great questions. What other dying questions do you have? I shouldn't say dying questions, but burning questions. That's the right term. My coffee wore off. It's not much of a question. It's more of a, you know, thought processing because, you know, we're here advising our kids about, you know, pros and cons of AP and dual. You know, you, you guys are making it clear that, you know, if they're going to take dual, you know, focus on gen ed core, you know, English history is, you know, maybe a government or two here and there. Um, and so they're taking all of these dual, because I think last year um, your panel kind of made it a point where all of these kids want to take all these dual courses, but then they're not really realizing how that impacts them in the future. And so they're taking all these dual credits, they're gaining all these courses and getting them out of the way. So by the time they get into undergrad, you know, they've already knocked out a good number of courses. And so they're kind of just limited to what they're missing before getting into your programs. Mm -hmm. and so, but then some of your programs, you know, you say that you're looking for students who are taking anywhere from 14 to 16 semester hours. That way they can kind of demonstrate they can handle the course load. So, you know, how can we better advise the kids on finding that balance? Because if they're taking all these dual courses just to take them because they're free and, and whatnot, what's going to be left for them to showcase once they get into undergrad? Well, and that's one of the reasons when we look at a lot of our programs, they break up the GPA. They may look at the overall GPA of the student, but they focus and they target the science GPA and things like that. And that's what we advise to stay away from the sciences. We know that we have students that come in with 30, 45, 50, 60 hours, and they've basically come in almost core complete to UTRGV. Like you said, they're only missing a few classes, but it also means then that once they get those when they're applying to UTRGV in that sense, they need to apply early. They need to go to orientation early and get registered as soon as possible because if there's an opportunity for them to apply to a program, I'm gonna use nursing for an example. We have met nursing students twice a year now. If they have a high HESI score and they retake it to get a higher score and they've got a really excellent GPA and they've got almost all the prerequisites done, in theory, they could probably almost be ready to apply to nursing their first semester at UTRGV. If they've got everything right, their chances of getting in are better than others. However, if for whatever reason they don't get in and they hold out, our students often fall into a little bit of a trap with financial aid. It's okay, I didn't get into nursing this time, so I'm gonna retake a class or my grades are really good. I'm gonna just study better for the HESI and they basically end up burning a semester and they've got to take their 12 hours to be full time, but they're taking coursework that doesn't apply to their degree or they retake coursework that could hurt them. But then they're in a situation now where they're taking off credits towards their overall financial aid package if they're dependent on that. So they really have to be careful and look at that situation. So I've advised all the students and as You'll see tomorrow with the presentation from nursing of the pre-recorded one in their Q&A. Just as an example, those students really need to be aware that the selection process is low. We admit twice a year now, but we only admit 60 students at a time. It used to be we admit around 120 once a year, now it's 60 twice a year. So they've got to look at those entry requirements and those program requirements from the very beginning. So if they're a junior in high school and they're like, I'm going to go to ETRGV and go into this field, they need to look at what the requirements are for admission into that program in college. Now, in our division, nursing, clinical laboratory sciences, communication sciences and disorders, biomedical sciences, social work, 
all have pre-admission requirements and an application process. And if they're coming in heavy with dual enrollment hours, they need to sit down and have that first conversation with their college advisor, like, I've already got all this. When do I apply to the program? Because some of our programs admit twice a year, some once a year. Like Dr. Chu mentioned, our biomedical science program, they admit the spring before, so they admit once a year, and they're admitting students out of high school, basically. Now, is there opportunity for some students to come in who are, okay, I'm a sophomore, but I want to be BMED? We have that opportunity, but those are few and far between compared to the high school student with a high GPA and all the right markers in place. I say something, um, Mr. Cantu, you mentioned about like for our program, we do look at the 14 hours, but as Dr. Lenny had mentioned, if they overall have a high GPA with the sciences, that'll still boost them. It's not really going to take away if they don't do 14 hours. It's just, you know, it'll compensate if during those dual enrollment classes, they actually get an A or a B. Now the issue becomes if they start getting a C on those classes, that's where it's really going to hurt them. And I know in the past I've had some students were like, oh, Ms. Villarreal, when I was in high school, I took dual enrollment. I ended up, you know, I wasn't, super, I wasn't so focused. So I ended up with a C or a D. And now I want to apply to med school and my GPA is a 2.9 or a 3.0 because of those previous dual enrollment classes. So I think, you know, the best thing to do is if they're going to do dual enrollment, that they are committed, especially if they're going to do any type of sciences and that they commit to an A or a B because otherwise it's, it can hurt them in the long run. It really can. That would be by advice for sure, okay, for high school. Okay, great. I don't see any other questions in the chat that have popped up and we've reached the end of our hour with our faculty from Health and Biomedical Sciences. So I wanna thank you all so much for your time Again, if you have additional questions, you, could, you can email cohpinfo at utrgv or health and biomedical sciences, spell it all out. And the questions will get relayed to the right faculty members. A listing of all the faculty and our contact information will be made available at the end of the conference. So we can do some follow-up if you have a desire for a campus visit, either your campus or ours, you can reach out to our office and we will work with you as best as we can. We also know that the fall could be a little rough on that, depending on how we open and how we do, but we've got some great technology. And as you can see, we've all become Zoom comfortable, some more than others, but we can definitely connect with your students any number of ways. So thank you all so much for your time. And with that, uh, we have a break until one o'clock when we have the School of Rehabilitation Services and Counseling. Uh, this Zoom is going to stay open. I think Ms. Hirata is probably gonna pause the recording so we don't yes, record an hour of open. snow, but we are gonna leave, we'll it, leave open, it open. So, so if you wanna come back after lunch, just click on the same link and it will let you back in. Thank you guys, enjoy your lunch.